there's a bunch of meetings in the afternoon so i will uh, i'm coming but i will be a little come bit whenever you want running it's around 30 at 5 o'clock come whenever you want i'm excited to be there yes um so i i'm sorry one minute i have started the um, recording so you all can press yes 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 yes, yes. and geeta very much just a chat as i told you um, yes yes you know, it's always lovely to talk to you but and particularly in this context because you know as what we've been really doing is yes. um, this particular month exploring mm-hmm. just how women professionals can lead a more fulfilled life during their career right um, yes so really looking at where those gaps are and uh, and talking to people who like you have solved for it for many years and hearing your perspectives and wisdom so that's really what is very much a free flowing conversation but that is sort of the perspective of it and um what i have often done is just really watched with admiration what jasmeet and you have both created at third eye but also this broader community that you built and you know it's it's really quite unusual in the work that we do in leadership development to be able to have that um and i want to come back to what i find unusual about it and ask you some questions around that but uh, just to start i just want to hear about the journey right what got you into consumer insights um you know tell us the story of you and of third eye okay so i think for me it's a phrase that i often use it's an accident of fate because i actually am a psychologist by training and i set out to be a therapist at a time in india when therapy was they didn't know the difference between being a tuition teacher and a therapist right so they would send kids to us to say maths mein fail ho gaya usko pass kara do and it was i mean i tried very hard to explain to people what i did and in those days and i'm talking about third eye is now 30 years old right they were so unless you went to business school if you did anything else that was an alternative career you either became a teacher or an engineer or a business school grad right there was not that much more that you could do any case so having done psychology now i didn't know how to engage what i had studied into the world and use it any case so i got a chance to do research through a bunch of different what should i say interventions from the universe and just me then i got together at that point i must say that i didn't even know what research was i didn't know how you could use psychology in anything else but in a closed counseling kind of setting so having understood now that i could actually understand consumers and their behavior it became a great starting point for us and for jasmeet and me it was very interesting and this i think is very useful it was a partnership and 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 to me i think women know how to partner and i don't want to make this a gendered conversation but i think women know understand partnership because from a very young age we've been taught to adapt to people which is not something that men are taught to do they are taught to assert and not adapt right there's a big difference i think women are taught to adapt and i think you case each other you know this is important it's what we've done all our lives in relationships i and again i don't want to come from from a space of judgment that but i think experience as you were starting with my experience i think jasmeet and i initially were also very different as people right and you know this better than anyone else you've seen the two of us in action i think we were able to adapt and i think we were able to do two things that i think were very critical for us we were able to bring feminine energy and we've talked about this in the ted talk and i've said this often to anyone who asks me it's a very different kind of energy than a masculine energy so i think it helped us build so one was what i did and how i applied what i had studied but i think i applied what i had been what i had learned about life in third eye and to me that was the biggest gift that third eye gave me and it continues to give me so it's a gift that continues to give me. but but as an interesting thing because i i think while you're saying there was an ethos that you you believed in uh when you go into the so called business world which is a very competitive world to still choose to build a collaborative culture which is really both how jasmeet and you work but also how you built the organization and frankly how the organization works with its uh, clients and the the broader community you build say a little more about you know where did that choice happen um how did it manifest okay so i think two things and i think it's a really important question um to answer because i think we had a very short stint in the corporate world 
if yeah. I want to call it corporate, it was a small research firm, but it was run with a, it had a very alpha mindset in those days, right? And they were, like I said, aggressive and the, as they should be, except that for us, it was for me personally, it was a very soul diminishing experience. I mm. felt that it did not value what I got to the table, but it valued a whole list of things that were supposed to be done. And I, again, I'm saying you will have KRAs and you will have but there is something unique in all of us, right? And it's important that you honor that as well. So you can't just turn around and say, I need you to do these six things and, you know, put you in a box and say, I think there's something unique in all of us. So what I think, and I don't think I intended it to be that way. But when I said, when I left and just me, then I set up third. And luckily for me, just me, that also been part of the same organization. So she knew, the same context. we knew intuitively, yeah, that this is not who we wanted to ever be. Because I think the one thing you need to do in order to build a successful organization, and this is not just balance sheets because and bottom lines, because those will happen and sometimes there will be factors from the outside that won't that will impede that growth. But I think critically for Jasmeet and me, what was important was that we needed people to bring their best selves to work and they needed to be happy. Because only when you're happy will you be able to actually bring your best self and work with people. To me, people undermine things like kindness, goodness, happiness. It's so undervalued in a corporate in the corporate world. So undervalued. You don't, it's so dehumanizing. And I think we were very clear because we had had a dehumanizing experience. Sometimes something has to break. Then you fix it and you fix it differently. For us, that was one really important thing. I think we knew. And when we began to build the business, the two of us in any case had a rhythm. When we got our first employee is when we actually put that into motion. Mm began to see the rewards of it because people will be very loyal to you when they when you're good to them there's no question of it if you honor them there is no way that people will not honor and respect you back i mean think about it it's a very simple thing either you know you say it in a very easy way but actually you are still working in an environment that is all of that suit masculine energy that's who your clients are um Tell us how you made that balance. Like any stories that come to mind. Yeah, when, yeah. How do we stand yeah. your ground even in that? I, it's easier when it's your organization, so within. But there is still an, an environment that you are working in. Um, and how did that work? So I think there were two things. I think, and I think it's interesting. Maybe it's a comment of those times and not today. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want to sound old when I say those times. But I think there are two things. And I genuinely believe this. So we actually resigned a client it's a big call we took, Swati. Wow. We designed a client because they were so alpha. So alpha. And I won't name them, but we resigned them because Jasmita and I realized that it was soul diminishing to work with them. They were just taking everything out of us. And they were, see, there has to be a, I think there is a culture of accountability and it's very critical. There has to be a culture of appreciation and clients need to understand that. You do good work. You have to be appreciative. Accountability is fundamental in any any in life and it becomes even more critical in a in the corporate world because you are accountable someone up there is accountable for numbers whatever but to me at the end of the day you needed appreciation and that appreciation i mean if you if the people just hold you accountable they beat you down they're critical and in psychology the critical parent is always the voice that comes to you we said okay we don't want to do it we were just the two of us and it was a big risk we took we said forget it the one thing we can do is choose who we work with. When we had a job, we could not choose who we work with. We'll choose. And if you're good guys, and I think faith is important. Sometimes we come from fear and not from faith. They will find us. And we found the most amazing client. So this client I will name. Our next big one became Cadbury's. And it's a bunch of really nice guys who mirrored our culture. Now, I'm not saying you go and say, okay, listen, we'll only work with people who are a cultural fit. But when you're building a business, I think you have to stand your ground and say, I'll take a risk. And I think sometimes it also perhaps also helped that you had each other. That there is, you know, you're not completely solitary in that decision. There is some somebody who's uh, with you on Absolute. that. Absolutely. And there, to me, in the in Jasmeet and me being together, what was very critical for us is in a partnership. Values become very critical. If you're not aligned on values, you may be very similar as people or very different as people. But if your fundamental values are not aligned, and to me, that's true of any relationship, but even more when you do a business or you have such a large shared goal, you have to have the same values. So if I'd said, no, no, this, this client is soul diminishing for me, but she had insisted, we would have just collapsed. 
So, and, and it has to not only come from intellect, intuitively, both people have to feel the same way. So, any case, so we went off. Sorry, finish. No, I can be consistent in that between each other. Exactly. Exactly. So we went off to Cadbury's. Uh, they were, we were, the other thing we did was we were very honest, Swati. We never pretended to be anything we were not. There were mm -hmm. times we would tell clients that, listen, we are very small and we are very new and we are very green and we may not be able to do this in the way that you want us to do it. And we don't want to take it on if we feel we can't do it because we let you down. Now, that kind of honesty is not something that corporate India does. Because you'd rather show muscle and all when you don't have it, you puff your chest up, you know. We were very honest and I think we were very authentic and it really worked for us because the guys who valued authenticity and honesty gave us work. Absolutely. And what it did, what it did Swati, is we built a relationship over time. You know, it's 30 years. They are yeah. still our clients. They sponsored to 2012 uh, Olympics. They flew 10 people to London. Mm -hmm. And we were one of the 10. They said the guys uh -huh. who helped us build it, yeah. But I'm saying it's a relationship thing. That's how you build relationships. And I think, you know, because we also work with so many young companies, I think there are two things I'm hearing you say. One, that while in early days you want to do every work that comes your way, actually till you are developing that muscle of who you are and what your culture is, it's important to find collaborators or even clients that you resonate with and then you find your voice and you're stronger about what you do uh, also the fact that you had each other and those values aligned and that's that's so critical when you're when you're tentative in those early years and then you get to a place where you also you put from what you're telling me is you've added value and so you uh, they see it so that also reinforces how you feel about you know the, the stance you've taken to be authentic to be uh, caring and kind. Um, but tell me, you know, and this is not just because you're a women-led organization, right? It's it's actually true for so many of the small companies we work with because they all want, they want that balance between empathy and accountability. And I know that, you know, even internally when you're being kind uh, and you're also bringing people on who are used to that outside world, how are there specific practices? How have you thought about that balance internally? So I think there are two or three things. I think you have to, I think when you when you hire, and I think it's important. Uh, in fact, it's interesting because when I was pre prepping this yesterday, I had a colleague sitting with me and she's young. And mm -hmm. I asked her these questions because I was curious to know mm -hmm. what she had to say. It was fascinating to listen to how you are perceived because you have a sense of what you are, right? And she said, listen, it's a bunch of really nice guys. So how do I, how do we create that and ensure it? Because yes, we hire people from the outside. I think it's what a very senior colleague of mine said. We have a process. It's a bit dumb. It's a bit like it's Darwinism or Darwin, where you have a process of natural selection. The guys who, the culture is very resilient and very strong. The people who stay are the guys who discover themselves. Somebody said to me in an appraisal this year, and she'd come from a really like corporate alpha male culture. And in fact, when we were hiring her, some of us were very worried because she was so out there, but she was senior and she would work for us. And I'm so glad we hired her. But at the end of the year, she was with, I mean, she's been with us for a year and a half now. She said something so lovely, Swati. She said, you make me want to be a better person. Now, to me, this is something that we all have in us. And I'm not the account. You have to be accountable. You have to give them feedback. You have to haul them up when they need to. But I think when they know you're hauling them up because you come from a good place and not because you want to belittle them or shame them because you've had a bad day. Because a lot of us carry, I mean, finally, we work for 12. In India, we work for 12 hours a day or 10 hours a day or whatever. Or we're always in work mode, right? We live with the people we work with in our heads, if not physically. You have to have positive feelings for them. And yes, there will be times when you will, you know, say things that hurt them. But you have to then be secure enough when they come to you. So we have a very open system. There are times when I will say things in terms of accountability and my message is right, but my manner is wrong. And often that to me is one of the biggest issues corporate India has. It's not that you don't hold people accountable. It's that your message is, you just say it so badly. Mm. Right? Because to me, it's not, to me, that's a practice that we've really tightened today. And we create, you know, in, in, in corporate India, we create KRAs, we create cycles of performance reviews, but we actually don't train people to be able to have these con conversations, which can be conflictual effectively, right? I mean, how do you both hold that balance between sort of 
questioning, but yet doing it in a way that intent is clear. Um, and there is also room to listen. I think that's that's actually a big missing gap. And what you're saying is you're, you are not doing away with the feedback. You're not doing away with the accountability. You're just, you're, you're very conscious of how those are had. Because I think there are two things in this. I think I am also accountable to them, right? This is not a one, accountability is not a one way street. So say more I about that. What do you mean by your... Okay. your so I had a, I have a very senior, and I'll give you an example. She's very, very senior in the organization. She actually heads the people mandate for us. And she's very fiercely protective of the culture of the people, everything, right? And she's been with us for a long time. We have all these long stairs. Attrition for us traditionally has been very low now. Of course, it's ramped up because we have all these Gen Zs around. But so I began to sense, and to me, that's again, I don't know again, I don't want to make it gendered, but I think you have to be able to sense that somebody is upset with you. You have mm. to be able to sense that people are not happy. You have to have that. You can't say, oh, I'm on performance, da, 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 do it or, or You have to keep off. that radar on, yeah. Keep that radar on. As a leader, empathy has to be one of your strongest suits. So, and maybe it's easier in a smaller organization. I don't know. But at least for your key people, the guys who will take this forward, you have to be empathetic. So I called her. I felt like, you know, there were times when she was snapping at me or whatever, whatever. So I called her and I said, hey, I need to talk to you. What have, what have we done, the two of us, that has got us to a place like this? Because we work, work very well together. What's happened to us? And uh, and she said, I know I've been feeling it too. I said, take your time. I'm not in any hurry. Take your time. When you are ready to speak to me, call me and we'll have a chat. So she thought about it for a while. And she called me two weeks later with a list of complaints. And she said, I'm going to do this in two ways. I'm going to f tell me if you have the time to listen. And I said, I always have the time to listen. And I will make the time to listen. If this is a bad time, I'll give you another time. Because I think it's important. She was wanting to say something and I had to hear her. She first went to Swati. And then she told me things that I, it, they're my blind spots. For any leader, they are blind spots. She said, you know, as a senior, I expect you to do X, Y, Z. So why should feedback only be one way? It has to be another way. I'm accountable as a leader to take them to a place, right? And she said, but you're not leading us the way we want to be led. Now, her thing was, tell me if this is this is how I am feeling. And I, my thing is, I cannot react there and justify myself. And that to me, when you do leadership training is very critical. You have yeah. to make sure leaders hear feedback. Leaders have to build that security to be able to say, and you have to have trust because I was able to take it because I knew she was coming from a good place. I knew she was not trying to mess with my head. She was not, I was not getting defensive. You know, there was a certain, and at the end of it, we both felt so much better. And she said to me, she sent me a message saying, thank you. This is the only place that I know where anyone can be heard and can have an honest conversation. So, I mean, accountability cuts both ways, right? But I think core to that premise is that we are building together, right? I think with many organizations that really? hire seats in where I know better, um, and and the feedback is even even in org organizations which say there is a there is 360 feedback it's more on how you're and you're treating a problem or you're treating your people rather than look this is how I want to be led I think that ability to create that space on their needs is also so so uh, unique actually um, it is because to me think about it Swati if I don't communicate clearly with you how will how will I know like this thing of knowing I think I know everything. And I, I admitted to her. I said, I think I, I get into that zone because I think I know everything. And she said, you don't listen. Leaders don't listen. And if they, you know, there's a big difference between truly listening, authentically listening and, and just hearing somebody or yeah. the other way around, however you say it. I think we don't do enough of it. We don't communicate. It, it can be a combination of, I mean, it's not always intent. It's just being fragmented, being in so many things. So you're you're just very task oriented and just making that time. And for you to say, take two weeks, let's find a window. I think those are, you know, those are little gaps. Those are little sort of spaces that are protected that make it possible. And, and you know, the amplification of that, because that's what the team hears. That's what... Uh, I think culture is not of what necessarily what you do every day. It's what you do in those little bits of uh, discomfort that then set a tone for what everybody does. Exactly. exactly. Um, in fact, to me, culture is lived and felt. It's never articulated. It's very hard. You have to set down some cultural tenets and then you have to let people behave those ways and you have to feel them. 
Absolutely. So you can put all the rituals in place, but if they're not done in the right spirit, there's uh, yeah. little value. But, you know, I wanted I wanted to uh, move tax from culture a little bit to your own journey. I mean, you've had a professional journey of 35 years. And when I see you right now, I just see, you know, the, the, the community that you have built in that time. And it's interesting because, say, many of the people that we work with are in their mid-30s and certainly the women. Um, I hear a lot of isolated sort of solitude is what they feel. I think at that point, you know, maybe friends even from college, et cetera, have made very different choices to stay in careers, not be elsewhere in the world. Um, your immediate colleagues, you're sort of feeling a bit competitive about. And they're, they're sort of feeling alone in this. And I've all the time that I've known the two of you, that has never been, um, I, you know, you've always had plenty of people. And I think you've actively built that community. And uh, I want you, you know, also networking is such a loaded word and it takes so much effort that often women feel this is not for me, right? It's just daunting or it's not something I uh, see of value. And, um, and yet there is this need for community. And I want to ask you what that experience has been and how you feel you are where you are today. So it's an interesting question because when I was looking at the questions you sent me, Networking was a word that jumped out and just means that I've historically said, oh, yeah. we don't know how to network, right? We always say this because we go to a party and I don't know how to work a room. I'm terrible at it. Really bad. I'll sit in one corner. You say and so they will feel like, and it's very binary because I don't know how to do that. I don't do anything. Exactly. So that when you sent me that question is when suddenly the penny dropped in my head and said, I may not know how to network in a room that's about corporate objectives, right? Because a lot of, how do you, define networking. Networking is also building a community. So to your question on, on, on how do we build a community, I think there are two things I personally have learned to do. And I think it works in life, whether you move to Goa, which is what I did. And every 10 years, I have a very large, like, what should I say, huge shift in the plates of my life. So this, you know, 30, 40 years, something happened to me now, 50 years, something happened to me and I moved to Goa. I think to be, so I think first you have to be a little more accepting of yourself and where you are in your life. People will be different. And I think women are now told that you have to be competitive. You have to be assertive. You know, I think we fundamentally, I learned over time through my own learning and my own life's journey that I think the best way to build a community is to accept, you know, inclusivity. And now it's been a much abused and used word. Is It's a feeling that people have. You don't include diverse people and call it inclusivity. I have to make you feel included. And to me, that's fundamental to community. And in order to build that community, wherever you go, you have to actually accept people for who they are. You have to see them for who they are. Anybody who's seen and heard, if I'm, and I'm not saying we're not competitive. We are not these guys with halos around us. Yes, we are. And there are times when I feel it, I feel every emotion that everyone else feels. But I think there's a softer side to us that, and the only way you can build a community is be open of people and what they say to you, be inclusive and be accepting. This doesn't mean it takes away. There'll be ego battles. There'll be all of that. But to me, these three are very important. And I think also recognizing, uh, you know, where you are and what you need at a particular moment, right? We do that for, for work. We, we reskill, we retool. Um, but I I think that I certainly see that, you know, you get to this, your mid-30s and you feel... <laughs> all my old friends are not there and you know you just have this moment of, of a total vacuum um and i asked this question because when i came when we met in goa we were in a restaurant and if i may tell the story there was you had just moved there you were meeting new people and i remember that owner of the restaurant said i'm new here too and she asked us uh you know maybe we'll exchange numbers and we'll go to the film festival together and i thought that that just you know her acknowledging that for all the history I might have somewhere else, here I'm starting from scratch. And just there was, there was an openness, there was a solving for how she felt, which I thought was quite empowered in, in a very gentle kind of way. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I think what people do is because you, first you begin by judging yourself, right? You come from a place. And I think some of us don't acknowledge, like for instance, I realize I'm very extroverted, but I'm what we I call a shy extrovert. It takes me a while to get to know people. Mm -hmm. And I'm shy about it, but I acknowledge that of myself. So, you know, we are so busy doing KRAs and looking outside of ourselves. And I think that to me is a very big journey. 
which women don't do enough of. I think nobody does. And at 35, you start need to start looking inwards. Because outwards, there'll be many goals. But we never set ourselves goals to say, let me go in, let me build some awareness of myself and who I am. We never do that. We never take time off. And we then go, I'm not saying go to a therapist. I'm saying there's many ways in which you can go within yourself. But you need to, that's the only way you'll build it. You have to be authentic to yourself. And these are big words, but they work. You need to get to know yourself a little bit. Play contrarian a bit, right? With I'm going to say with so much on someone's plate, um, the ask of both build a, build a community of peers who support you or, you know, who, who inspire you, who feed different sides of you uh, is a big ask. Right? There's enough on my plate already. Uh, even to say, you know, do the self-reflection because know who you are is also work. Um, as you think of the last so many years, tell me why you think women, like if I were to say to someone, do it, and they said, why, what is that going to enable? What would you say? So I think two, three things. I think if I look back and I think, okay, so I'm going to break my life into many phases, right? If I look at the 38-year-old me, and that's the question you ask, right? And yeah. the 40-year-old me and the 58-year-old me. Other than the extra gray hair that I have today, I probably look younger now than I did at 38. I think I'm much wiser because at 38, sometimes life knocks you around, right? And you get knocked. It The difference between the 38-year-old Gita, 48-year-old Gita and 58-year-old Gita is reflection. And I get what you're saying. It's very hard. It's also not easy. We're not equipped. It's easy for me because I studied the subject. I have better tools in my own arsenal to say, okay, this is the way to do it. Most people may not be able to do it. But if you do not reflect and you don't build awareness, you constantly react. And to me, this thing of, oh, you must respond and not react, it's really BS. Because as human beings, we will react, right? No, it's true. I mean, dogs react, cats react. I mean, it's an in innate response for us to yeah. react to something. It is holding that reaction that we have. Now I'm saying, how do you build? To me, we don't see that. And there is nobody, we don't trust enough, Swati. One of the biggest reasons why we are isolated is because we don't trust the other person. And there's such a trust deficit in our culture in India today. We were trusting. Think about your mother or my mother. They yeah. build community. Uh, were they isolated? No. Were they reflective? No. I, I, my mother used to say, oh, what is this? All this stuff you tell me, I don't even understand these words. They were not self-aware. I mean, I'm 20 times more self-aware than my mother and my aunt. I mean, they were lovely people, but they trusted people. They believed in people. If somebody said, I'll do this for you, they didn't say, oh, he's doing it because or she's doing it because or what's, their, what's in it for them? We don't trust if you don't. And organizations also built on trust. You have to believe this guy comes to you because... He is, wants to do good work, not because oh, the, you, so, and you can only build trust when you, when you, what should I say? At least control judgment, you can't suspend it. So to me, the answer at 35 is you stop building trust. Your good friends have gone away. Hmm. There are new people in the community. You don't know how to trust them. First, you don't know how to do it. You've also become more, with time, I become socially, I mean, there's a part of me that becomes more confident, but I'm also more self-conscious because I become comparative and relative. Yeah, it's one about, right? You don't trust enough. It's very hard then to build a community. Anywhere, even, I mean, I ask in your leadership work, just do a trust index and see how much they trust the guys below them. And yet what's remarkable is you've taken another big risk sort of two years ago and moved cities, right? You you really reinvented a new life. So tell me, you know, going there, no com no existing community what has that been like what have, where have you begun and what have you done because i think the I same think, levels prevail when you're 38 as, as they do now totally and i think i think okay so if you ask me the difference between all the my successful decisions and some of the mistakes i made my successful ones were came from thinking but not overthinking it's a big difference hmm. i thought about it it's not like i didn't think i mean I, I mean, Jasmeet and I always say, oh, we dived into the deep end. If we had thought about it, we won't, may not have done the business. I don't know. We talk about it often. I think the difference was, it wasn't like we, were, we did it. There's no spontaneity. These are the big decisions. You can't make them spontaneous. But I think there is a difference between thinking and overthinking. We are now in a culture that overthinks everything. I yeah. think so too. All the time. We are overthinking. Some of my best decisions have come when I've thought, I've thought and not. And it's a very fine line, Swati, but we need to make it. Sometimes, again, it comes from trust. I just said, I'll go. If I'd overthought it, I wouldn't have gone. I went. So there is some degree of, to me, the magic happens when the intellect and the intuition meet. You have to feel it and say, okay. And you've got to believe. 
these are all very like things, but I have to say this in the wisdom of it. There is a larger energy in a universe that does protect you. You're a good person, yeah. Good things will happen to you. It just trust it. But if you start thinking, do balance sheet calculate. I'm not saying don't do that. It's important. But overthinking it will not make us, will scare us. I also find that I think as you get more successful into those late 30s, early 40s, uh, your faith in yourself actually diminishes, even if confidence goes up, right? You you, you know it, you're, you may be more assertive, but that ability to, exactly as you're saying, trust, good things will happen to you, try something, if it doesn't work, you will change it. That ease of being able to, you know, you call it taking risks, to, uh, call it agility, but that diminishes and so you... As you said, you've got to think about it. Where am I? Maybe I want to shift something because that's what's sensible 10 years from now. But then that first step you take with more ease rather than judging yourself at every level. I think that's exactly. the... Exactly. exactly. And I think the other thing is, I think as you grow older, and to your point, as you become more successful, you think you have a lot more to lose. So you begin to fear what you will lose rather than fear what you will gain because often we don't think of the upside and say, okay... What's the worst? I mean, I have people, I mean, there are times when I get very anxious and I have some very good friends who say to me, it's the worst thing that will happen. Think about it. Think mm. about moving to, uh, what would happen? You could come back to Bombay. I mean, how bad can it get, right? It's not like, and, and to me, that's the difference between overthinking and thinking. You say, okay, because I have so much to lose. Oh, I can't let this go. I can't let, you know, what, what if, I think sometimes the, yes, the what ifs are important, but they can't take over. So you understand the floor. If it doesn't look bad, then you can take the leap, kind of. Uh, I mean, what will happen? You ha and see, when you're 35, you're cushioned. When you're mm -hmm. 25, you're not cushioned. And the yeah. fear is valid. This is a fear. It's a psychological fear. It's not a physical one. This is in your head. What's the worst thing that will happen? You'll come back home. But the fear has an interpretation and a meaning. You know, and you've given it because there's a so, you know, when you were saying it, I was thinking at 35, I had an image of myself, mm. of who I was. Yeah. And I didn't want that to crack. At 45, the image had already cracked. And it now at 55, though it had completely disintegrated and some new person was born out of it. But I think we hold on. We don't let go. And, and I think that reinvention has served so many people well, including you. That's how, you know, you've got to do it. You've got to make that leap. You, you've made them before, but you felt like those were just things that happened automatically in your 20s when actually there has been that you just maybe haven't overthought it as much and so I haven't thought and the yeah. things that I've overthought Swati I've made a mess of her, by the way <laughs> so I can tell you that there's a big difference between thinking and overthinking I've but often I thought also the paralysis of it and then I think if you're unfulfilled or unhappy in a situation you've got to change it right I think even that just exactly. knowing that maybe choose away from this uh, the next step that first step is the hard one um, you know, I know you have a big birthday coming up this month. Uh, I, I'm sure you've been doing a lot of reflection. Just, you've also been someone who's collected so many young people. I mean, I, you've taken care of, I, they've been in your house, they've been in your organization, you've mentored them. Um, what is your one advice that you offer young women uh, as they are starting out in their careers? I want to ask you first as they're starting out and then as they are in their 30s. I think two things. And like I said, I think you've got to trust. You've got to be, I think, especially young people. I think they're, and I, I think the Gen Z's are a little different. They're not like running to get to somewhere. This is different from the millennials. But I think there is a huge, like I said, the trust deficit. I don't, you know, I feel alone because I don't even trust my best friend. You've got to believe at some stage in life that people are fragile. So I say I don't trust, but I come from so many expectations of life and of myself. And that expectation amplification is what, to me, the young people feel. I don't know if the difference between my mother and me was she didn't expect so much from life and of herself. And I'm not saying don't expect, but also acknowledge and know where you're coming from. Trust yourself a little bit. Know that it won't happen tomorrow morning or day after. You've got to give yourself, yourself and life a little more space. I don't think we do enough of that. I think we put too much pressure on ourselves and the pressure is not to just get somewhere. It's the pressure to be a kind of person. It's, I think there is some perfection and I think we need to understand. I know everyone says this, embrace your imperfections and all the rest of it. But I think there's some truth to the trust of life. You've got to trust it. 
And I'm not saying go with the flow or any of that because you can't go with the flow, man. You have goals and you want to get somewhere. But trust that it will happen. Trust yourself. Anxiety comes, uh, Swati, because we don't trust ourselves enough. We don't trust the world only. And I think for this particular, and you do a lot of market research on this generation, we've talked about it. Um, also, the fact that there are so many options actually has amplified their need to choose well, when actually perhaps it is just choose, you know, we'll make a different choice later. Exactly, because to me, it doesn't matter. And I think it's, again, so to me, there are two things. One is image and you can't, cannot do anything about it because the culture pushes an image on you. You can't change that because, I mean, I can say don't live in an image, but at 20. Gita? Did we lose her or did I get lost? I think it's her. She's frozen. She'll come back. Yeah. I'll just message. Yeah. I'm muting my screen. I think we're almost done, right? Yeah, I think we're done. You, you won your last question, right? Second one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How long have you been? It's been what, 35 minutes. Hmm. About 35 minutes. Yeah. And she's exited. I think she'll join in again. So we'll just wait. Yeah. Hi. Sorry. I'm joined from my phone. Okay. No. I, I, we are a bit I, now, now, now you're fine. Okay. Um, oh, it says your connection is unstable. Okay. Yeah. You're good. Go. I think, uh, yeah. Let's go. Okay. No, so uh, we were almost done. With that. Just, maybe maybe we just uh, look at that one question again so we get it in one shot. Just what you were saying, um, given all the work that you do with Gen Z in terms of market research and understand them, what would your one advice to them be as they start that journey? I think you have to be more trusting of yourself and of the world. And I think you have to not look for what's wrong within yourself and what's I think we become the heart to take some people ourselves because there's so much pressure to be a particular way and to expect so much of ourselves. I don't think we are kind of, this is said again and again, but I think we need to be kind to ourselves. And at the five you look back and say, need to do it. I think it's important. The other one piece of advice I would give to any 25-year-old is please sometimes ask some reverse nurturance. They I'm not coming to for Gita. I'm going to suggest maybe uh, we just turn the uh, the video off. Maybe it's less heavy that way. Is that okay? Better. Yeah, that's fine. Better. Yeah, much better. I much joined better. to the party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just tell us what you said about your uh, thing about the 25 year old. We're saying advice for a 25 year old. Yeah. 
do we have Gita? Sorry, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me now? You guys can hear me now, yeah. Swati, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you perfectly. Okay, good. All right, so now what I was saying, at, for a 25-year-old, three things. I think you need to trust yourself and the world because they put a lot of pressure on themselves. There's so much pressure of expectations. They don't give themselves enough elbow room to do stuff. I think you've just got to give yourself a little bit. You, I think you need to just say it'll be okay. We don't say that enough. We're con they constantly focus on what's wrong. What's wrong with the person? What standards are high. Expectations are high. Acceptance is low. All of this. And like I said, at some stage, there is some wisdom in life to trust and ask somebody older because often what happens is they don't know they talk that it's an echo chamber. Everyone talks about the same thing. They are wiser in some ways, but there is something to be said for experience in life. Uh, I think as somebody older who's nurtured so many, I just let them be. They're used to being told what to do. I always, it's worked well for me and I always say it's because I'm not a parent. I don't judge them. I mean, they come to me and they tell me stuff. I laugh and I listen. Sometimes I feel maybe there's a time to give advice. I give it. Yeah. I think they need acceptance. They don't constantly need to be told, but they don't accept themselves at all. So that's that to me is one big part. I think we have to all become a little kinder and more accepting of ourselves. I think that's a that's a really uh, valuable lesson to to leave this on. But thank you. I think it's true whether you're 25, whether you're 35, whether you're 45 or beyond, it's um, be kinder to yourself, have faith in yourself. And I think as you have done from that place, uh, create a community that also nurtures you, inspires you, supports you. Um, so thank you very, very much, Gita. That was fabulous. Thank you, Swati. Really thank, thank, thank you. See you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay, ending it here. We're coming there. Thank you. Should I leave the meeting or what should yeah, I do? No, leave. We'll uh, do the guest intro on the phone. Yeah, we'll come there. You want to come and do this? Yes, okay. we're coming there now. I'm leaving, okay? Yes, yes, yes.